three, two. Welcome back, WNSG, Taos in Baltimore, and Baltimore positive. And there is nothing more positive than being here with Matt Gallagher <laughs> doing the red, white, and blue at Fadley Seafood. And um, there, there was a crab cake. Well, there. I always say Matt's a food guy. <laughs> Big time. There, there was a crab cake there, but I, it was he's delicious. Not, so he's not only one responsible. Um, outstanding. Nothing, what can we say? Nothing Fadley. more Baltimore positive than Fadley's. And uh, we're here with Matt Gallagher. And, and we're going to get into – once once Danny brings the food out, the oh, show – man, yeah. You know, the conversation. I, I like direction. the direction we're going. How are we going to discuss public <laughs> policy now is what well, I want to know. Nestor, I do want to – I kid Matt all Food the time. Food security. All the, I do kid Matt all the time that he is uh, – he's one of the best Facebook followers because he, <laughs> he loves to post – Wherever he goes to eat, and would it fair to say that you're a foodie? It's very fair to say. I'm we a were discussing and, and wine and reduction <laughs> and stuff like that as we uh, as we made it go. So, so uh, what what are some of your you're, you're always discovering new places in Baltimore? It's Baltimore positive. Where have you been lately that you say, "Hey, man, if you haven't been there, get down there." Um, so That's there delicious. is a new uh, Asian inspired uh, place in Hamden called Tiger Style from the uh, people from the food market. It's a BYOB restaurant that's right off of the avenue that has unbelievable uh, Asian food. Um, really, really good. Have been going there a couple of different times. That's a great notes. spot. I'm that's on this. Um, <laughs> I love you know, Asian food. I mean, I love Hamden. I absolutely love Hamden. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very short walk for us. Another Baltimore jewel. Absolutely. So, you know, we're at Pauly G's a good bit for pizza. My kids love it there. That's some unbelievable pizza. Um, that's a that's a favorite of ours. Um, you know, Steve Carney turned me on to Chuck's Trading Post. Another foodie. Yeah, another <laughs> foodie. Um, unbelievable one skillet breakfast um, that you go in, and I'm particularly partial to the Spaniard. That's yes, you're a breakfast guy. Chorizo. Take some notes. It's, it's unbelievable. You got to get over there. It's, uh, it's I'm an eater. I don't know if you know this about me. <laughs> well, or not, look, you, you keep a very trim figure. <laughs> I just want to tell That's you. That's because I walk around Baltimore. Freeman right? Rabaski thought he was 27 years old. He's never going to get over that. The, the, the <laughs> perception of Baltimore. Are you people, upset by this? No, people no. say to me, okay. well, how do I stay skinny? The God's honest truth is we moved downtown in 2003. So everything that I did in the suburbs, I got in my, I walked to my carport, and then I drove to the mall. Uh, this is, you know, like, I walk everywhere. So... I mean, in part of the city and, and, and walking around at night, I've been all over the world. I talk about Hong Kong or Paris or Sydney or these beautiful, yeah. you know, even Rio, these places I've been. I love Baltimore, and I think Baltimore has a future and a vista and hope and all of this. I don't know if it includes the baseball team. And, you know, sitting here, people say, why are you sitting talking to policy people and eating crabs and talking about the future of Baltimore? It's because I don't think we can control the baseball thing. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm gravely concerned about that and what it means for me, for the city, for my career as a 50-year-old. People say, you know, you can talk about sports forever. I'm worried about sports in general, too, right? I mean, and I know you're yeah. a big, big sports guy. I'm a big sports guy. Look, it's absolutely critical that people in Baltimore pay attention to the Orioles. Their lease is coming up. We've got to make sure that we lock this team into Baltimore. I believe they're staying when I see a signed lease. Well, let's, let's jump. Let's take that, Matt. You, you were both, uh, you were the key advisor, number one advisor to the mayor, number one advisor to the governor. Um, if we, if we... If we roll the clock back and this same thing is happening and Matt Gallagher's with Mayor O'Malley and then Governor O'Malley, what, do, what are you banging on the table saying should be happening regarding the Orioles as it's coming up? What would you, what would you be telling them as government officials we got to be doing? I mean, as government officials, I would be saying to the Maryland Stadium Authority, what's the status right now of lease negotiations? What do we have to do to make sure that we get a renewal that, you know, the Baltimore Orioles are an iconic, you know, part of this city part of the fabric of the city you know major cities have major league baseball teams and football teams and orchestras and other cultural amenities and you know civic institutions that you just have to have and you got to sit down you got to sit down with the ownership and you got to say we got to get this done and we need you here permanently and you know we've got the most iconic stadium in the right. entire country without a doubt yeah and but uh, that family's used as an atm for 25 years as an aside look I mean, I, you know, look, I mean, negotiating with us one thing, but them being on the phone with Las Vegas and Portland and Nashville thinking this is their opportunity to leave, I, I'm a little older than you. He's older than both of us. I watched this, 
And this doesn't usually have a happy ending. If they want to stay here, they should be down with Larry trying to figure it out right now and well, get the deal look, done, right? Hopefully they are, but I, I, I just hope that people realize that this is really, really important, and it's an issue that's very, very much below the radar screen right now, and it needs to get more attention. Well, it's funny, Matt, because we, we talked about months ago, um, we talked about Nestor what was happening at Harbor Place. You know, Nestor looks down on Harbor Place. You can see what's happening. He walks around all the time. And months ago, we were saying that people needed, and much the way you're saying about the Orioles, need to get focused on Harbor Place because something's happening there and it's not good. And now we see it's in receivership. We've got issues. Um, from your perspective, Baltimore guy, what, what, should, what should happen? What would, be, what would be a good result for Harbor Place? I mean, to have some paying tenants would be a good start. <laughs> um, look, it needs to be an attraction. It needs you, to be a place everybody wants to go. When from you visit everywhere. Baltimore, you have to be able to go to the harbor. There have to be things that are going to want to attract you down there. If you live in the city, it's got to be a place that you feel is accessible, and it's a place that you want to spend time. Whether it's you're going down there for lunch because you work downtown, whether it's you're going to go to the science center or the aquarium, or you want to like walk or bike along the promenade. It's got to be an amenity that's responsive to everybody right now. And, you know, when you have these issues around public safety at night and people saying, I'm afraid to go down there, you know, a lot of it, I think, is just, you know, ridiculous. You know, oh, it's media driven. You. I walk it's through the It's completely media driven, yes. but we've got to combat that perception. Right. And, you know, people have to go down there like you and post and they see it's safe. You're having a great time. You're having a good dinner. You're out with friends. You see a diverse collection of people. And that it's inviting so that whether you live in the heart of Baltimore, whether you live out in the county in Catonsville, like you feel like I want to be down there and there's something for me. Well, I spend long stretches of my days from Pasadena to Bel Air, uh, up in Carroll County, where people say I'm never coming back to the city yeah, and it because kills they're me. watching I, the I, news. It kills I hear me. the same thing. And you gotta be, you gotta be persistent. You gotta invite them down. You gotta tell them, like, look, if you're satisfied, you know, eating at Applebee's is a big night out. Hey, have at it. But you know, we got a lot better <laughs> options down here in Baltimore. Including well, we've got these, these right yeah, <laughs> we've got these great, rich, diverse neighborhoods. Now, none of us here are Pollyannas. You started, Matt, in the first se uh, segment, saying we have real challenges. So when we talk about this being media driven. We mean that, but we also recognize that we do have public safety challenges. But we, we all believe that we can get that turned around. And in the meantime, there is no reason not to come into the city. My wife and I come into the city all of the time to restaurants. We go to many Oriole games. Nestor can't figure out why we go to Don's as many. Don's looking for Hamilton tickets if you have any. I, I actually have seen Hamilton, <laughs> but we do go to the Hippodrome all the time. But we, we part of it, as you said, we've got to fight back. And it, it seems to me that whether the next mayor is you or the next mayor is Nestor, I know you didn't want me to bring that up. You laughed at you. You didn't laugh well, at me. Well, no, no. Because Matt knows. You're credible. Matt, no, <laughs> Matt knows that on everybody's short list, his name comes up and he's going to say what all good folks would say is that you're very happy at the Gold Sucker <laughs> Is that Do I answer that question? I'm very right? happy at the Gold Sucker <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. So, 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 so hang on. So. If you were mayor, what, what, what are the first five things you do if you're a mayor? It's, look, it's not about five things. It's about 100 things. Okay, fair you enough. you got to go in every direction all at once. You do have to set priorities. But, look, you got to put out a list. you got to put out a plan. And it's got to be actionable things that people understand and can buy into. And they can say, they I'm don't understand that. the infrastructure for the CSX tunnel under – under the, they don't understand that? Yeah, not so much. Yeah, they don't get not that. Not so but much. that's really important. That's really important. <laughs> you know, you've got you to move out in 10 different directions, and then you've got to go out and you've got to find dozens and dozens of people who are capable and willing to serve. Because okay. this is not a one-man show. It's not a one-woman show. You need the Justice League. Barbara McCall there's not one, one, with no Superman. There's no there's Superman. The there's no Wonder Woman. You've got to get all those superheroes together, and you've got to say... I need you to take care of the housing. I need you to take care of the transportation. I need you to take care of the health. And you got to recruit these superstars who want to make a name for themselves, who are invested in the city, who are you know in league together. And you got to get this battleship moving in the right direction. Well, Matt, Matt, take us back then. Let's really roll the clock back. Uh, you came with Martin O'Malley as mayor in what, 2000? 2000. Yeah, let, me, 2000. let me ask you this, because I was going to write a book 20 years ago called First Look. I was going to find, Don, the first time you laid eyes on Linda was where and how. When's the right. first time you laid eyes on, 
on Martin O'Malley. When did you meet him, and how did you meet him? Because ah, he certainly question. affected your life, right? Like yeah. early. Look, if you didn't meet him, things would have been different for Matt Gallagher. I was, uh, you know, born and raised here, but I went to college and graduate school in Philadelphia. Uh, met an unbelievable woman who I'm gratefully married to right now, who is from Philadelphia. You know, I thought I was going to be in Philadelphia for the rest of my life. I, was ta- I took a job working for Ed Rendell, who was the mayor of Philadelphia. I worked for about five years. I was in law school at night in Philadelphia. The Penn? Uh, I was at Temple. I went to Penn for government administration. I went to LaSalle, undergrad for economics. Man's had a lot of cheesesteaks. I've made my way. I'm making my way through the big five. Um, but what happened was. Have you seen a game at the Palestra? Oh, <laughs> dozens, of dozens, dozens of times. I haven't been to the Palestra. You've got to be kidding. No, dozens of times. Oh, my Lord. Lord. I want to see a okay. big game there. You know, like a, a, a full. Any big five game is a big game. That's the thing. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, we're going to work on we that. Digress. We're gonna, we're going to put a pin in that. Right. But, but go back. Um, Catherine know, Pugh was from Philadelphia, too. I'll point that out. But uh, <laughs> So, 99, out of nowhere, Martin gets elected. I'm sitting in the mayor's office in Philadelphia. A bunch of uh, people from the Baltimore civic community come to Philadelphia to learn how Philadelphia was doing things. First of all, a pretty good idea to go and find out yeah, how somebody look, else was doing Rendell had a really crazy, successful right. administration. It was winding down. I meet Don Fry, you know, John Morton, who was running Bank of America, Don Hutchinson, one mm-hmm. of your predecessors. And they said, look, we got to turn around Baltimore. We need a plan. We want to figure out how Philadelphia did it. I met with those guys. And before they were back in Baltimore, I'd faxed my resume down. And literally days later, I got hired to manage the transition. I met Martin in February of 2000. I was sitting in Michael Enright's office. He'd been in office about two months. It was a holiday. I don't know if it was President's Day or Martin Luther King Day. The city was closed. I was in the mayor's office. He came in. We had a long conversation about labor negotiations, what was going on in public safety in the city. And not long after, they invited me into the administration to run CityStat. So now, now let's pick it up there. So it was not a friendship in any way. Never, I never met him. Wow. When I and sent, he was already, you weren't on the campaign or anything. I sent that. my resume to the transition, okay. and somebody wrote, like, mayor's office on top of it, and I never got a call. And I found that resume years later when they were archiving <laughs> all the materials. Um, look, look, it was serendipity, and the Rendell people were really nice and gave me a good plug when I came down here. Ed Rendell and David Cohen, who was running Philadelphia back then, would come to Baltimore and they'd say, Matt Gallagher's the guy, and he did great stuff for us in Philadelphia. Those guys couldn't have picked me out of a lineup, you know, when I was working in the mayor's office in Philadelphia, but it gave me street cred down here. How many people are working in the mayor's office in Philadelphia when you were there? So there were a couple of different departments um, within the mayor's office. You had a couple of dozen people who were, like, in policy roles. I was, you know, doing a job. I was an assistant deputy mayor, and we were basically the in-house management consultants. So we were kind of dispatched into agencies to try to turn things around, execute, like, projects that the agencies weren't capable of doing The mayor's of office is here, and that was you? Basically, yeah. yeah. Okay, fair yeah. enough. We were, the, we were kind of the, the Jedi. So, so this is what Nestor really likes. It's the, the nuts and bolts. So, I mean, became nationally renowned city stat. Walk us through city stat. You come there. Govern- I mean, the mayor at some point says, all right, Matt, we need to hold people accountable. Yep. I want some kind of program based on a ComStat, which had had some publicity. Tell us how city stat was structured and why, from your perspective, it was effective and can be effective again. Yeah. So there was a ComStat program that really organized everything that was happening around public safety. You Talk know, about ComStat. Just for my yeah. all, you know, don't it's walk okay. this up. Let's start it's, at the beginning. It's cops on dots. It's okay. taking a map. It's looking where your crime is, what time your crime happens, seeing where your police officers are, and trying to put the police officers into areas where the crime is most prevalent. It's real-time, rapid deployment of resources to be responsive to what's going on in the community. And in 2000, when Baltimore City instituted ComStat, you got to remember, it had been 10 straight years of 300-plus homicides. It had been the 1990s, a decade where Baltimore lost more population than any other U.S. city. It was the most drug-addicted city in the country. They institute so ComStat. we were at the bottom. We I were mean, at the bottom. Right. We institute ComStat, and we start to see real reductions in violent crime, homicides, shootings, rapes, aggravated assaults, you know, robberies, all of those things. The numbers start to come down. And then Mayor O'Malley was like, wow. I've got a data-driven management system. I've got people motivated. I got a way to hold them accountable. I wish I had this for everything else that the city did. Did, 
And, you know, Jack Maple, who was one of the architects right. of CompStat, the said... The commish. The commish. From TV, The original fame. commish. Right. Um, said, look, Martin, there's no reason you can't do that. It's just never been done. And Martin turned to a handful of us, and he was like, look, I want to do... He said city stat, and we're like, okay. He's like, CompStat for everything else. And we were like, all right. And he's like, you got two months. And it got stood up 59 days later. We didn't think anybody would care about what we were doing. Um, and then a few years later, we won the Innovation and Gover right. Government Award, which is like the Oscars of government. And then like two years after that, like we had one month where we had 11 countries send delegations to Baltimore to learn about what CityStat was doing. And I mean, it, it's not an exaggeration. So it's probably like the everybody. most replicated, you know, government program of the 2000s. Nestor, before you jump to CityStat, I mm -hmm. want to jump back because I think sure. you're, you're right to drill down. Comstat, you look at it. You're all of a sudden being data-driven, cops on dots, and crime numbers begin to come down. Tell us why. And, and I, I know it's a tough question, but people, I think people may say, wait a minute, why? Why did it get turned around Look, because of this? Because when you're measuring what you do, when you're monitoring very closely what your deployment is, when you're asking probing questions about why are we in this place as opposed to that place, you have the ability in very close to real time to redeploy your assets and your resources and try to be in places where you can disrupt crime as much as possible. And if you can do that effectively and then layer in other services, whether it's drug treatment, whether it's clean and dirty alleys, whether it's boarding a vacant property, you have an ability to make change in the near term while you're kind of catching up on all the other things that have to happen in that community to make it safe going forward. So we were getting more out of the police department. We were engaged. We were focusing in on, you know, we didn't coin the phrase. It's a Fred Bielfeld phrase, you know, bad guys with guns. And we were really trying to get better and better and better at focusing in the areas where we needed the most intervention. We weren't taking, you know, the new police officers that came from the uh, Clinton cops program and saying, let's divide them up equally among the nine districts. We were sent them to the Eastern District and the Western District and the Northwestern District, where the level of violence was multiple times larger than in North Baltimore, or Neath Best Northeast Baltimore. Best cops in the worst places. places. So then twice. Yeah, and the most cops. And then twice yeah. a month. Uh, the well, Comstat was every week. Was every week. Every week at the police department, and then it was every week in City Hall. Wow. So we were all over it. And if the police well, it was department was the biggest said, problem in the city, right? It was. Like, right, okay. I mean, Absolutely. It still is, right? It still is. still is. Yep. So, so what are they using now? Or, or may I ask, or do we know? Or what was the remnant left behind? Because I know the remnant of, like, Harbor Place. I see what that is. I see the remnant of what the Orioles have become 25 years. I mean, when, when things aren't tended to, the crabs don't look this good, you know? That's true. Literally. That's true. So what are we doing now? Look, there's still a comp stat. There's still a city stat. I'm, you know, to be honest, I can't tell you with what uh, vigor it's right. being pursued right now. Uh, I mean, the evidence that you see kind of out on the street and in communities are that we've gotten away from some of the strategies that we're really working for. Because, us. Matt, there's nothing worse, right? That, that's a great answer. That's such an honest answer to say there still is one. <clears throat> excuse me. I can't tell you to what degree. Because there's really nothing worse than to have it, but not really have it, right? I mean, that's I, I, I'm not going to ask you because you're in the in. But if in you the world, have, you have statistics, to interact, they need to fair. be analyzed by Correct. someone to know what to do with them. That's but look, the, the, the statistics right? aren't good right now. Like, there's no mystery behind that. You know, we're still. I guess this is going to be the fifth or sixth year where we're on pace for more than 300 homicides. You know, we're less than a decade removed from you know being under 200. You go back to the 2000s. All the way through 2014, I think we had 14 straight years where we were below 300 and in one year below 200. You know, we were doing things that were working. But 20 years later, there, there are people that would say it was draconian and it couldn't be done that way again where everybody's getting no, arrested. No, no, but that's not, you know, that's a huge oversimplification. You have to evolve your public safety strategies all the time. You have to be making adjustments, just like you would if you were a baseball coach or a football coach. you got to figure out what's working and what's not working. The reality is that in Baltimore City right now, one-third of the homicide victims and homicide suspects and non-fatal shooting victims and suspects are under state supervision, parole and probation. you got one-third. got a very aggressive population that is driving a disproportionate level of violence in the city. And if you can laser focus on that population 
And for some people say, oh, you know, that's over-policing. It's not if it's drug treatment. It's not if it's drug testing. It's not if it's job placement. It's not if you're surrounding that population with services and you're imposing sanctions when necessary. But you've got to laser focus on that. You've got to intervene. It's got to be data-driven. And you've got to have alignment between the Baltimore City Police, the state parole and probation, the judicial system. You know, look, I'm in no way, shape, or form saying that there should be any less focus on the performance of the Baltimore City Police Department, but there should be a hell of a lot more focus on the state's attorney's office, the State Department of Parole and Probation, and the judicial system. Because, because it is it's a, a continuum. Well, Absolutely. Yes. It is. We, we give Dan Roderick's credit all the time on here. Wrote an article recently. He said it's not one thing. And no. that's what you say. It's not. Don't. Folks, we can multitask. Absolutely. It's not one yeah. thing. Well, I mean, maybe that's the, the hardest because you mentioned baseball, and I do baseball for a living, and I have not become the nerd about, you know, s- saber me- because Don and I don't talk about whip, and we don't talk, mm-hmm. and we don't, we don't speak in those terms. And I think so much of this, when you're, if you're going to run for mayor, you're going to win, you're going to be in church. The citizens don't know what the police are up against, but we have respect for what they do. You'd like to think there's a level of competency there. And Don has said many, many times, the next mayor has to have a hatred of incompetence. Of incompetence. Yeah. You just can't tolerate I mean, I, you guys had that reputation. I yeah, mean, I mean you, you were famous. I mean, you, you didn't have a, a great threshold for incompetence. Fair enough. Look, in city stat, <laughs> we were seeing every secretary, every agency head every two weeks. And if you're smacked in the face, right. you know, every two weeks with incompetence in action and just failure, you're like, we got to make a change. Right. You right. know, we right. got next, next man or next woman up. And, you, got, you know, the, the, this, like, the, the controversy and the tension and the arguments got a disproportionate amount of attention. But what was happening was we could see what was going on. We're interacting with the leadership on a regular basis. And there were consequences. Well, you had an expectation. Nestor yeah. knows. I mentioned to you during the break. I thought when Senator Bill Ferguson railed against the pools, I thought he was exactly right. How do we end up at Memorial Day again? When Memorial Day, last time I checked, comes every year, right? It comes every year. It's not like it's not like it yep. pops up occasionally. Right. And we know the pools are supposed to open. I would think on if Memorial you get the pools Day. open Memorial Day, you better have it together by St. Patrick's. That's Day. what you, you have right. to, right? Literally, yep. right? Every and there should be checklists, and you should say like, "This has to be done by this date. This has to be done by this date." And you got to say to that secretary or agency head, and then the head of pools, you know, where are we? And you got to hold them accountable for that. And if they need help from the finance department or they need help from general services, you know, the people who are doing the construction, you got to get them all in a room and get it worked out. I mean, look. You know, coordination and cooperation, not like naturally occurring events when it comes to <laughs> right. people sometimes. you got to force that. There so. you go. Hurting you wanted, cats, you, you, yeah. wanted, you wanted deep and rich discussions about how to make government work. This has been fun. You certainly got that. Real quick, Nestor, I know we're coming up on the end of the show. Can't let Matt well, get away. Well, the crab cake's gone. Yeah. We can <laughs> say oh, we're going to get We're going to do crabs, some crabs right? later. <laughs> Preakness. Yep. To walk us through the Preakness. What should happen? Where are we? It should your stay. Point? There should be a, you know, a comprehensive, you know, project that reinvigorates, uh, you know, not just the Pimlico site, but all of Park Heights. It shouldn't be $450 million. It should be on a much smaller scale. You've probably traveled around to, you know, big golf tournaments. You know, you've probably been to events where they put up temporary facilities. The 400 plus million price tag is absolutely insane and ridiculous. The Preakness has to be here. Was you that done with a purpose, Matt? Was the 450 floated to uh, I, I'm move not quickly down the road? I think that there was a lot of oh, well, interest. Well, come on, man. It's like no, I need a house. Yeah, uh, uh, what yeah. kind of house do you need? Yeah. Look, oh, I need a house. They in wanted, they wanted, grand. There was a time they wanted to move the Preakness to Laurel. I think that that's pretty obvious and transparent. Thankfully, people in Baltimore woke up in time, got Thank involved. Thank you, Sandy Rosenberg yeah, and others. And fought like hell. And now that seems to have turned. And if you scale the project the correct way, you figure out a way to get people to Pimlico, you know, the other 363 days of the year outside of the Preakness and the, uh, the Black Eyed Susan, and whether it's ball fields, whether it's mixed-use office, whether it's some residential, whether it's Sinai expanding one way, you know, you've got a ton of options up there. You can do, you know, economic development. You can layer in some state capital money. Like, if it's a $150 million plan, there's a way to get there. There's a way to cobble those resources together. I saw the Detroit thing where, you know, they, they've had sustainable 
neighborhoods and, and, uh, and Michelle Obama gets laughed at about her garden and all you and I do sit here and talk about how nice these to me. You know, why do we not have – why aren't we moving more toward that when we're tearing down structure and having a real shrinkage of population here to, to move toward things that are sustainable, truly, not, not – just an empty park that becomes the next park where something bad happens, but something where good things happen and the community can get involved. Yeah, well, Community I mean, space, I would call it. If you want to go, I can take you around community space and I can show you community gardens all day long. And I can show you people growing all kinds of different things. We, we got a challenge here. We got 16,000 vacant properties around the city. You, you know, as much as people say you got to rehabilitate all those you know, properties... Are you going to put one hundred and fifty thousand dollars into a vacant property that's only going to be worth eighty thousand after you right. rehabilitate it? You got to make some tough decisions in terms of what comes down, what gets rehabilitated, where you can have density, where you can't have density. And it's not inexpensive to tear them down. It's not inexpensive at all. If you do it in the middle of a block, you got to take the building down brick by brick. You got to repair both sides because you got homeowners on either side. You, you know, we're at a point like where you got to look at string demolitions where you take down a whole block. You got to work with the neighborhood to figure out what's going to go in the place, whether it's a pocket park, whether it's parking, whether it's the type of housing that people want right now. You know, you got to meet people where they are. You got to engage the community. I would, I would argue that we're not doing enough demolition in the city right now, that we haven't been able to move off that 16,000 number for a very, very long time. We've been treading water. It's a little bit unclear to me, like, where all the core money's going. You know, I, I saw that there was a press event the other day where they said 4,000 units were demolished, 4,000 demolition units. And, I mean, it sounded like a blood drive. Right. It didn't right. sound like they were taking <laughs> down buildings. Um, you know, there are just places where it's going to be really hard to bring an area back. You know, but then there are other places, like, where if we can find buildable lots, if we can go for more density, there's real opportunities there. Before we get out of here, now, we always ask folks who have been somewhat involved. When the, I couldn't remember. When the governor ran... For president, right now in the midst of obviously uh, heated Democratic primary, were you involved? Uh, did you were you a volunteer helping on that side of the? So I had left in 2013. You know, Governor is a very good friend. Always support him. So I gave him a lot of moral support. Gave him a lot of help. Um, you know, personally, um, but I was not officially part of the. Give campaign. us some insight since you were so close to the governor. Give us some insight as to what it feels like for the candidates and their inner circle as they try to navigate this crazy primary season. What are, what are these Democratic candidates going through now? What's it feel like? It's brutal. You know, anybody who, like, likes that process is nuts. You know, you're, you turn your life upside down. It's terrible for your, you know, your, your, your marriage. It's, you know, it's terrible for your kids. It's terrible for your bank account. But you've generally got people who really believe that they can make a difference yeah. and who are willing to kind of make enormous personal sacrifices to hopefully, you know, bring about a better vision for what's going on in our country. Yeah, I saw people crapping on the, you know, the, the kids' table and the adults' table in two nights, and I said, these are 20 people that all have... You know, relatively sane ideas. And leaving it I all out I don't know about there. the author woman. She's a little weird. But, uh, you know, even you know, her and her stones or whatever she had going <laughs> on. Uh, but, but hearing that kind of conversation, America needs that. Yeah. Not food fights every day right. on cable news. Let's, let's have real people doing real things. Yep. Look, I mean, you see it in sports all the time. You know, sports radio, which obviously you know. And people weighing in on what the coach does and what the player does. And the rookie who's coming up and making mistakes. They're real people. You know, and look, elected officials are exactly right. the same. You know, they can't all thread the needle like this guy in terms of being beloved by everybody. <laughs> when you don't have to run, it well, makes I it know. a little easier, I man. know, and you don't have to raise money, <laughs> but, you know, look, it's, uh, you know, people who get into elected politics are making tremendous sacrifices. And, yes, it's a privilege to serve. But, you know, they get treated like doormats right. half the it's time. Amazing. And it's really unfortunate. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Nestor, I don't know about you. I feel a lot better about Baltimore today having spent some time <laughs> with Matt Gallagher. I think we need to have him back. Uh, Anytime. Matt, th so much. We're going to go on to another segment now. We're going to actually figure out if we know anything about eating a crab down here at Fadey. I'm going to hate this segment. <laughs> go ahead, Nestor. Take You're going to tell me here. I've been doing it wrong for 50 years. Matt Gallagher from Goldsecker, former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller. You can find him on the streets of Catonsville uh, anytime during the 4th of July. We're signing off from Fadey. Here we go. We're in Lexington Market. <laughs> <laughs> we are Baltimore Positive and WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking. Baltimore Sports. Great stuff.